Uh, welcome you all. Um, hope you had a good lunch and thank you for attending this talk. Um, yeah, my name is Thomas. I, uh, I'm a software engineer for our studio. I started in October. Um, and I am working mainly uh, within the graphics stack of R. So my main day-to-day -day work is improving the performance, the capabilities of the plots that you're doing make, using ggplot2 or baseplot also and so on. Um, I also generally do a lot of packages, I enjoy it a lot. Um, I am the, the author of the Lime package, so before you feel that there's been a beef or anything, I generally agree with the, with the conclusions that were, um, but we can always, uh, if you have any questions about that, we can always uh, talk about it afterwards. Um, but I'm not going to talk about graphic performance, I'm not going to talk about machine interpretability or anything like that. I'm going to talk about creative coding, which is something that I enjoy quite a lot. So, um, just to set the scene. So, what is uh, creative coding? Um, creative coding is kind of ill-defined. It's whatever you do coding while feeling creative, I would say. Um, it is a fantastic outlet um, for, uh, for kind of an urge to, uh, to produce something. Um, and it's a fantastic thing to share on Twitter or, or wherever. So just some, some examples. This is um, these kind of looping GIFs are, are super, uh, super fun, I think, um, and, and quite popular on Twitter. This is a guy called Beast, it's not called Beast and Bumps, but goes under the moniker <laughs> Beast and Bumps, um, who, is, who is one of those that just continues to amaze you with, with sort of these weird shape transformations where you constantly begin to guess what is what is the shape, what is the negative shape, and so on. That, he makes super fancy stuff. Um, another possibility is um, Etienne Jacob. He, uh, he does super fun thing with, with different kind of noise-based uh, manipulations of strings. Super mesmerizing, um, super interesting to just kind of drift away in. Um, another, should be some sound here, maybe, if it's that, yeah. Um, another guy doing super amazing stuff is, is someone called Ravenquark. Um, so, just I'm just gonna let it play a bit. But this is kind of the inter intermediate between like sound and visuals and, and how to interpret uh, photography and so on. I'll not let it play fully out, but I just want you to see it. So taking code, taking audio input, taking visual input, doing weird stuff with it. He is he's a master in these kind of things. And this is this is just him coding. He's doing it more or less live on, on, on Twitter. You can you can follow his uh, his progression through various ideas and so on. Really feeling the the artistic uh, process of it. So it's it's super impressive. It doesn't have to be visual, of course. Um, creative coding is just whatever creativity flows from you. Uh, Lin Cherny has been uh, playing a lot with, um, with text generation using uh, natural language processing techniques and so on. This is one of her projects where she has kind of merged image interpretation from, uh, from neural networks, coupled that with uh, generative text to create poems based, uh, coupled with, with imagery and so on. Also a lot of fun stuff. And again, this is kind of just for fun. She has a creative drive. Um, this is not taken for the quality of that specific poem, but just um, it can be whatever makes you feel productive and creative. Another example of, of uh, text generation, this is one of the newer things that has sprung out of, uh, of one of Google's um, deep neural network models. Uh, a guy called Mario Klingemann, who is um, he's one of the first to, to sell AI-based AI uh, um, artwork on uh, on auctions and so on. He's doing fantastic stuff. He's also been playing with just this generative text uh, model to, to kind of tune it into creating artificial quotes. I think some of these are fantastically funny. Um, just just for fun. Um, <coughs> in the R world, we haven't been doing that much. We're super serious people, right? So <laughs> we can't be bothered with all this, but. It's not been completely absent. There, there are some people that has kind of been in the forefront uh, of it. Uh, one of them is um, Antonio Chincon. I think I'm pronouncing it right. Otherwise, sorry. 
Um, he has been blogging about uh, math-based art for, uh, for years. Um, this is uh, this fractal-based uh, art made in R. Um, another one, um, Markus Waltz, um, he started around the same time I got into generative artwork, has also been interested in, in kind of these, uh, the, the patterns you can get out of mathematics formulas and how to, to kind of show them. Um, something, some new coming up, um, Will Chase um, is on Twitter and he's, he's uh, currently doing a 12 month of, of art where he's blogging each month about a, a new subject for using R together with um, creating some sort of art. This is a um, strange attractors that he has been uh, looking into, some chaos theory and so on, um, where you can kind of follow his creative process as he, as he looks into how to use R for this sort of, sort of stuff. Um, so you can do a lot. And you can do a lot with R, of course. I'm, I'm mainly going to talk about the visual side of it because that's, that's where I am. But um, R is also just a fantastic platform for, for generating um, imagery. Like we have, we have fantastic plotting capabilities in R and there's no reason why that shouldn't be able to be used for artistic purpose. So before we, we go any further, um, so this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, I have one kind of thing I kind of need to say, um, and, and that is that doing this sort of thing, like, like playing around for fun, it's, it's kind of a privilege. And I just, it, you can feel a lot um, when, when you are embedded in this world that everyone is just chasing the new thing and building stuff and oh, I don't feel I have time for all this. And the same thing is kind of actually true with these kind of spare time projects where you just well, I'm just I'm just a creative soul doing stuff on on the side and so on. Um, so you can it's easy to feel like I, I should be doing more, um, and 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 you shouldn't really feel like that. Oh, sorry, that was the wrong way. Um, there are like various reasons why you don't go home after this and just sit down and okay, I'm going to be the next next Picasso with a computer. Um, and all of these are valid reasons, like it's perfectly fine to not think coding is super fun. Like you can, you can be super good at coding and have it as a day job, but don't feel like, well, I want to spend all my free time on it as well. That's, that's perfectly okay. Um, and, and one of the reasons why it would be okay is, well, you have better things to do in your spare time. You actually have hobbies and so on, which is, is super healthy. <laughs> um, and, th and those hobbies don't have to revolve around coding. And, and so, so don't, kind of feel pressured into giving up those just to, to chase some kind of imaginary horse. Um, potentially you don't have any spare time, like, like the idea of spare time in itself is, is super privileged. You might be a single mother with three kids that don't, like, don't have the time to do that and you shouldn't feel the pressure to, to spend additional time outside of work to doing this kind of things. Um, you might not be motivated, you might not be inspired, all of that is kind of just saying it's okay if you don't kind of feel the urge after this talk and you, and you should now you, you should really um, be proud of, of, of having a different kind of, of life a different kind of um, spare time interest or, or just being super proud about having to deal with a lot of stuff that means that you don't have that much spare time um, the reason why I really feel that this should be set out is that we have this horrible wife sometimes that that you, if you don't like, if you didn't learn programming by a 12 year assembling your own computer and, and writing your own programming language, you're not really a real programmer. Um, and and it can like it. This can be vocalized by by some nasty people, but it can also just be um, perceived from yourself by the the inherent surplus of others. Like you you can see on on the internet, people have super much spare time and they do all these stuff, they're blocking, they're writing packages in their spare time, they're doing all this kind of fancy stuff and feeling that, well, I should be doing that as well to feel as, as good as them and it's, it's kind of pervasive in, in our culture and um, no one else is living your life so, so don't judge yourself by the actions of others. So just, I had to get that out. So. Back to you. So, so this is going to be about creative coding for you. This is not because I'm doing it. This is because you, after this talk, may want to do it. It's not because I said this is something you should go home and do in your spare time. So, creative coding for you. Um, even though you, you kind of 
want to buy into this whole notion of, of I want to do this in my spare time, um, you can still feel like, well, I can't really afford to spend coding time on fun in my spare time. Um, it's easy to feel perpetually behind in this ever-changing technology landscape. So shouldn't I better use my spare time to kind of catching up on all this? Uh, should I be using Kubernetes or using Swarm or using whatever else or, or something like Shouldn't I be doing something that, that is kind of um, bringing me further on with my coding? Um, and, and having fun is not the way to get ahead with this. Um, so I'm just going to flip it out. This is not for fun at all. Oh, well, maybe. Uh, maybe a little bit. That's, this is not only for fun. I'm trying to, to kind of sell you the idea that um, doing this, if you enjoy it and doing this, then there is legitimately fantastic reasons also from a kind of cost-benefit sense of, of just sitting down and having fun. Um, so, why should we do creative coding? Um, one of the things is that, well, I personally see programming as a creative endower. Um, not everyone will agree with that. Someone will, will think programming is just deeply analytical and there is no creativity putting into that. It's just right and wrong and so on. But a lot of programming itself is in problem decomposition. It's in, in understanding your, uh, your problem area and figuring out clever ways to, to solve that. And that is, in my point of view, a creative endeavor. Um, so if you spend some time honing that skill, and that doesn't need to be specifically within the, the area of the problems that you solve it, um, at your work, but if you just get better at thinking creatively, I think you get better at, at solving the problems in your job as well. Um, also, usually when we, when we work with whatever we're working with, with our, we, have a, like we have a domain. I, I'm working within, um, before I, I started, all of this, I was uh, in bioinformatics, so, so I was working within the field of, of uh, comparative genomics. We have our algorithms, we have our way of thinking and so on. And, and usually, whatever problem we comes up with in any area, the chances of someone else in a different area having solved that before you is it's quite big. Um, so, so like the, the, the spoon is getting, or the wheel is getting reinvented all the time. Creative coding is, uh, is a fantastic way to get out of your like, domain your comfort zone and just how are people drawing these weird shapes or whatever like how, how, do, I, how do I solve things that are not kind of ingrained in my own domain uh, and getting out of that comfort zone is, is just inherently good um, another fantastic thing is that the output is, is usually tangible and it is something that you yourself can evaluate I had this vision I wanted to create a picture of some sort did I create a picture I did. did. Did it look like I expected or did it look even better or did it follow the rules that I set up or whatever? Like it's, it's super easy for yourself to judge what you end up doing it. Not necessarily in a, in a kind of, um, in, in the sense of is this uh, a masterpiece of paintings, but just did I, did I solve the, the programmatic problem that I set out to solve? Um, and it, this can be quite difficult in your day-to-day -day work because a lot of the problems are quite abstract and it's quite difficult to figure out, well, did I really solve this modeling task that well? I get to, it's difficult to evaluate models, for instance, um, and, and feel super confident that you did evaluate it without any bias whatsoever and, and came to the perfect conclusion. Um, so it's, it's quite nice to have this kind of just tangible output. Why? I created something. Um, and, and people like beautiful things, mostly. So, so whatever comes out of this is also, if, if, you, if you care about your online persona, and not that you sh necessarily should, but if you, if you are in like, the online community and so on, doing creative coding is a fantastic way to show off. And it's a fantastic way to engage with people that don't really, like if you, if you work with optimizing a specific type of algorithmic problem, like that's, that's not super tweetable. Um, and it's not super like engaging for people that are not super into that particular problem, throwing up an image or throwing up a, a video or throwing up something that, that you created is, is much more engaging because people in general can relate to it. Um, oh, that was too fast. Oh, that will be an example. <laughs> um, one thing that I particularly enjoy is that, um, well, I have a wife. She's a, she's a high school teacher and, and she has, like, she has no concept of what I'm doing at all. And I 
that's not a problem at all. I don't have any concept about how she managed to teach high school kids. I, I would be horrible at that. But, um, but the fact that I, in my spare time, can do something that is tangible or tangential to, to what I'm doing at work and, and actually have a kind of a discussion with her and then I get some feedback from, from friends and family, not just her, is, is super, uh, super nice. Um, and in the end, and this is what I'm, the example we'll get into, I think you generally learn better if you're self-driven by solving some problem. Like, if, if you impose a purpose on, on your own kind of development, you will, you'll reach there sooner and you'll feel better about yourself. Um, and unless you go home and start doing this because you feel like I told you so, uh, you should do that, but if you actually get, go home and do that because you, well, I, it's actually quite fun to produce something, then you will be self-driven and, and, and you, will, you will kind of learn stuff along the way that would have been super difficult for you to be motivated to learning um, had it not been your own choice. So, um, I'll, I'll just have an example from my own work. Uh, it's kind of picked at random, so if you don't like it, that's fine. It's not picked for artistic purpose. Um, and, and also, I'll, I'll kind of conflate a lot of development into that single piece. Nothing happens just to create one single image. So that there's a lot of work that I talk about that, that sounds like, well, I did all of this just to create that one image. It, it has, it's, of course, a continuous process and so on, but bear that in mind. So this is, uh, the, this is something called Unfold 0.9. Um, just the algorithm is called Unfold by me, and, and there's, it can generate multitudes. Um, and how did I, so, so, so what did I need to do to get there? Um, well, first and foremost, I had some sort of idea about what I wanted to do. Um, and I needed, I could either just pick up a paintbrush and begin drawing that, but that's not really my vice, um, and I'm not really good at it. So somehow I had to in express that vision in code somehow. Um, and in code that didn't exist, like there, there's not a package to make that. So, so like I had to sit down and well, well how, how do I get from, from blank page to, to there? Um, and that involved learning about particle simulation, which is not something that I would have learned about otherwise, because why should I? I'm not a particle physics, so, um, so there's not much, much to learn about that. So, um, and part of that would be how to learn how to do, uh, to implement a quad tree, because that's necessary for barnes hutt approximation, which is necessary to model how particles interact gravitationally with each other. Uh, that had to be implemented in C++ because otherwise it would be super, uh, super slow and so on. So this is not something I would have done otherwise. I, I promise you, I wouldn't have done that. Uh, um, furthermore, this was kind of building on top of, of uh, something defined in D3. So I had to learn, like read the source code of D3, which is also in, that's in JavaScript. So I had to learn some JavaScript. I had to understand D3 well enough. Um, I had to figure out, so this, this is, Many of these things are based on, on stacking of, of images because you, it's quite difficult to, to draw these kind of gradients in R. So the best thing is actually to just create a, a lot of, of different frames and stack them on top of each other. Problem is that, that you, can't really, you can't really do that because R, the output of R is 8-bit um, is colors. So you, don't ha you only have like 255 uh, translucency values. So if you, if you stack... Even the most translucent image, if you stack a thousand on top of those, it will be completely black. So I had to figure out, well, how, how do we deal with that as well? Um, and of course, just experiment with all the different settings that, uh, that went into all of this. So, so I, I hope you can figure out, well, was I having like fun fun? <laughs> no, was I enjoying myself? I, I was absolutely enjoying myself. Like, I, just the, the idea of having this end goal, producing this kind of thing, meant that even though I, I was not directly having fun, I, I was definitely having uh, having an enjoyable time. And as I talked about, there, is some, uh, there, there was something coming out of that. Um, I actually made a pa uh, package for, for these sort of things called particles, which does particle simulation. Um, I had multiple interactions with Mike Bostock, who is uh, the author of D3, so like, he's a good person to have interactions with. 
Um, and I, I learned about quad trees. I learned about a lot of things. And I got a, I got talked about tweetable image. But also, I got some pride. I got some motivation. I got some experience in all of these things. Like, like I could, I could sit back afterwards and say, well, I actually solved that. I actually had an idea, and I, I kind of figure out how to do it, and I was successful because I could look at this and say, well, that, that pretty much matched my vision. Um, so, so what all this comes to is that we can like learning stuff is usually in in like our day to day work we don't we don't take courses like as part of our um when you get out in the real world um we, like we don't have a week where we just sit down and, and and get fed stuff we we have work to do we have a lot to do and we don't have time to just sit down and 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 go through all of this stuff that we need so when we need to learn stuff, it's usually because it's driven by some external factor. I need to, to learn this because I need this to solve my problem. Um, and and so, so if, if that problem is like, let's call it a figurative literate, um, if, if this is just whatever is not motivating you, of course, um, like we, we will all, if, if possible, we'll just run away. Of course, we cannot always run away because maybe our salary depends on us solving this this problem. But I, I will be dragged kicking and screaming over that mountain and emerge with bruises and all that stuff um, because it's a turd over there. Um, if we just switch it out, like this is this is really basic motivational stuff. <laughs> we'll just kind of dance over the mountain. We, we are still climbing the mountain, of course, but but. It's, it's not that big of a deal because we have something we, that we really want on the other side and we get to eat that cake. Um, and, the, and the great thing is that, that we might still be presented with the turd afterwards because we have a day job uh, and, and they will present us with problems. But the good thing is that we have climbed that, that mountain before so it's, it's kind of non-existent now so we'll just kind of <laughs> somersault over there and not necessarily eat the turd or enjoy eating the turd but it was at least easier to get over there and we were not bruised on the way so I hope I can like this is of course kind of a silly example but the idea that that if you solve these kind of problems on your own by your own accord um, when you eventually need to, to solve similar problems in other situations, they, they are much, much easier to solve. Um, furthermore, if you solve some problems, then you might learn stuff that you didn't know would actually solve that, that third problem much easier and get you faster to the, okay, the, the, the analogy breaks down there. Um, so how do you like, what inspired me to do that? And how do you in general, if, if you don't feel a creative drive or haven't really honed, honed that uh, creative drive for, for years, it might feel like, yeah, I, I think that would be cool, creating beautiful stuff, that would be cool, but how on earth am I going to, to get inspired for this? Um, and there are, of course, multitudes of ways of, of getting inspired. I, I would say Twitter and, and some of the people's uh, artwork I showed up there is a fantastic way to just follow them and see whatever they're doing because it's it's massively impressive what they're doing. So, so usually you would just feel, sit down and say, I wonder how they did that. And then kind of the, the train of thoughts will, will just emerge from here. So I'll take um, another example from my own real life um, about how I was inspired to do this. Um, this is about a generative approach to, uh, to watercolor or in layman's terms, just simulating watercolor painting with R or any other programming language. So this was not something that like, there was not a, a deep drive within me that I had since I was a kid. It was it was something that came spur of the moment. I, I I'm following Shirley Wu on uh, on Twitter um, for her data viz uh, originally, um, but she does super interesting stuff. And um, at one point, she was just tweeting. Uh, she, she was trying to do a data visualization. She wanted to have this kind of organic feel, and 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 she was experimenting with with doing watercolor simulation in, uh, in JavaScript, um, which kind of intrigued me. And she was tweeting at, at, at some guy called Tyler Hubs, uh, who had written a blog post about it, and she was trying to kind of implement 
that algorithm and, and, and needed some help. So so through that, I, I kind of learned about Tyler Hobbs. I visited the, his, uh, his web page, so that was the blog about generative approach to simulating watercolor paint and, and something um, ending up in, in some sort of polygon deformation. So that was kind of what led me there. Um, and I kind of got inspired in general because me personally, I, I feel quite inspired by um, taking this kind of hard logic that we have in programming and, and use that to get more unpredictive organic outputs, sort of like what you see with, with, uh, with watercolor. I think I find it quite uh, intriguing to, to create these kind of organic patterns um, with code. So, so that really, um, that really uh, spoke to me. So, so I, was, uh, I was super pumped to, to get into this. So naturally, uh, I didn't do that because I had a lot of other stuff to do. Um, and then that is also okay. You can, you can get inspired and you can carry it around in your head for years, uh, which is what happened with this. Um, uh, it can, and, it, and usually some, some sort of th this kind of inspiration, if it's just rummaging around in your subconscious, it's, it can do wonders. Like and, and in general problem solving, if, it, if you just let it slip, reside a bit and then work around in your subconscious, you will at one day wake up in the middle of the night and, and just, whoa, now I know how to solve it. Um, with this, this is mostly about me not having time, um, which is, is kind of prevalent in, in our everyday life. Um, but one year later, I, uh, I was beginning to thinking about, about this, and this kind of uh, ended up being um, driven by my need to, to make this presentation as well. So, um, so I, I could kind of justify that I actually sat down and, and, and kind of got this urge out. So, um, but started also just in general starting to work with our studio has made my spare time a bit more free because I have developed way too many packages in my spare time. And now I can kind of push that into my, my paid work, which is super nice. So, so I have a bit of surplus in my, uh, in my evening time now. So, so I could actually sit down and begin to experiment with this. So, so the cool thing about um, this idea is that it's quite simple. It's actually so simple that I didn't have to go back and rewrote the, re re read the, the blog post. I could, I could remember the, the basic principles of it, so I could just sit down and, and, and play with it. Um, and and it, it's... Actually, super simple. So you start with a, a with a polygon and and uh, quite a simple one, and then we just um, insert nodes and we uh, we move them a bit. We insert new nodes, move them a bit. Insert new nodes, move them a bit. We can agree that it doesn't look like watercolor paint, um, but if you do that enough times, not not continuing this, but starting over and over again with the same kind of polygon and randomizing the, the movement of these, uh, these nodes and then laying it up top of each other, we actually get something that is, um, is, is kind of reminiscent of, of some sort of watercolor. Um, so this was, uh, this was super, uh, super fun. Um, and and um, the, the, there's a bit more going on here because we can see that there are areas with more kind of chaotic behavior than others. Um, this is generally just because the starting polygon had, had areas where the, the offsetting was, was more pronounced than others, and that would just translate to more chaotic and more defined areas. Um, so that was really it. And um, so, so did, we, did we get creative with that? Like we were just implementing some other guy's work. Is that really creative? Well, I think we absolutely do. did. Um, first thing is that, well, Tyler was, was kind enough to not provide the code. Um, which is also why this is a zero code presentation. Um, because like he, he described in layman's term, this is the idea behind the algorithm. And just going from that into code takes at least some, uh, some cognitive load and I would say also creativity because you, you begin to earn the, uh, own the process more um, and you begin to just be able to um, uh, take ownership of, of the different choices that you make while you're do, doing the, the implementation. Um, and also we, we began playing with uh, a lot of, of stuff that is super useful in, in a lot of generative artwork. So things like recursion, you, you had no idea how interesting patterns you can do 
by just recursing over very very simple uh, simple formulas and so on. Um, but should we stop here? No, oh, not at all. Um, this is a fantastic first step, but I wanted more. There's like there are problems here that I'm not. Um, I, th I think we can do better. Um, first of all, it, it's it's super slow. Um, you can imagine that continuing this process of, of continually subdividing each edge will lead to really complex polygons. Like like th this one, I I think it's around half a million points, like combined with, with all the different layers there. Um, and it takes some time to render. It takes some time to generate. This is this is too much for me. I want it faster. Um, Another thing is that we don't really have that much control over the shape because we have to start with a simple shape because if we start with a complex shape we will have even more points because we'll always subdivide um, the number of, of, of edges again and again and again. And furthermore there's, there's these kind of small annoyances like you can see the starting points as fixed kind of uh, artifacts in the artwork. You can see areas where there's no variation at all like the, the, whole, uh, the whole painting kind of converges around that which is also annoying to me. So, um, so I want to do it better. Um, and we have a little time. So, so what I want, kind of want you to do is just, how would you solve this? I won't, like, I won't test you in this at all. <laughs> but, uh, but just kind of, so, so what is the problem? We want to simulate watercolor. What is, what is watercolor? Like, like what, is the, what is the shape? What is... What is the characteristics that we want our code to produce? So just think about it for a moment. Maybe discuss it with your uh, with your neighbor. How could you uh, how could you solve this? Not a complete setup. Like it's, it takes more time than a minute. I know that. Um, it can be a completely new approach. It can be uh, some some additions or changes to the to the current approach. Just just think about it for a bit. And then the next minute you have to implement. Time's up. You cannot be creative anymore. Now you have to sit back and listen again. <laughs> no. It was just a, a small kind of, of uh, demo into kind of specific problem. How do you kind of begin to think about that? And of course it takes longer than a minute. But, but you can already begin to have some kind of tangible idea about how you would approach that. So <clears throat> I did approach that and I did take more than one minute. Um, so, so my new approach to this is completely, more or less completely different to, to Tyler's, which is, is kind of nice because now I completely own the whole process and can kind of take control over everything and also blame myself if it, if it doesn't produce the thing I want to do. Um, so what I wanted to do was take whatever shape and then superimpose it on a, on a noise um, and derive like X and Y um, uh, deformations and then move the different nodes to that. So, so kind of simple. We have this, <coughs> this idea of, um, of Perlin noise, which is noise that kind of look like cloud. It's, it's not white noise. There is some structure to it, but it's still random. <coughs> and, and we can use two of these to, uh, to kind of um, deform whatever shape we, we, we fit into it in a, in a way that that's kind of looks organic. And we can do this 200 times as well and modify the, the deformation a bit, kind of what Tyler was doing. Um, and we get something like this. And you might think, well, this is kind of what we saw before. The, th the nice thing is that um, we can start with any kind of complex shape because we're not introducing new nodes. We're just moving those around that, that we have. So we can actually have some control over the, over the, the pattern that we want to, to end up with this, uh, with this watercolor thing. Um, 
and and it's it's kind of easier to control because you can look at the noise you can actually modify the noise to to fit your needs and and, and so on so you have a lot of, of things that you can actually play with to get the output that you that you wanted are we there yet <coughs> oh no, of course not but i don't have time to get into to whatever else could be could be done but we can have things like as i talked about we can we can use it to actually draw images with this kind of thing because it can take a take a shape in we can add texture because like in the middle it's just completely even colored but we can actually do even crazier things to get, give it texture we can animate it i'm i'm love animation so of course we need to animate it as well so um the goal posts are always changing once you feel like you have you're done with something you you will usually figure out a new goal on the way that you want to go to. And this is just fantastic because it gives you a new creative <coughs> purpose to learn something new. So wrapping up, um, I think I have said that like a multitude of times, but, but programming treat it as something creative. Be, be proud that you can solve stuff creatively. Uh, of course, with the knowledge of, of uh, analytical uh, approaches and so on, but, but the way that you come to get the ideas about how to solve it is, is usually creative. So hone this, um, train your creativity. Uh, and it's not easy to get inspired, like it, it takes time. So these are just some of the people that I have uh, talked to or um, shown work from. They will tweet other people's work. So if you go down that rabbit hole and just follow these people, you will be presented with a multitude of other fantastic people that can inspire you and say, oh my God, how on earth did they do that? So I think that's it. If there's time for questions, I will like to take them.